So we have this on slide thing, which uh, is pretty cool. So if you want to participate, you'll be able to vote, and you'll be able to kind of give us good praise and not so praise. <laughs> There's a WTF button. So. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the WTF button, in order that you do it one time, for slide group. For slide group. Now, so, you won't button. know what a slide group is, so. <laughs> <laughs> but feel free. I think when we first get the first thing up there, everyone should get it out of their system. But seriously, <laughs> if you've used your WTF and you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll try to keep my head above the computer. Uh, I think I'm probably about half and half looking at code and yammering. Uh, I yammer a lot. If I'm running on, somebody will just be like, shut up. It's cool. Uh, I think we're informal because there's beer and pizza. Uh, so it seems pretty informal. Uh, and Anteo Group used to give me my checks back in the day, so thank you, Anteo Group, for that. Uh, and as far as presenting, uh, he's not kidding. I mentioned a month ago, I was like, hey, I might want to present something. And he's like, well, send me an outline. And I sent an outline, and he's like, all right, you're going to do it. I'm like, all right, cool, give me a couple months. And he's like, ah, a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. And, I, and, and I was like, I'll do something small. Maybe I can split the night or something. Uh, and this is what we got. So I wasn't sure if anyone was interested in what I do because this is technically an HTML5 group. And I, I'm not going to talk too much about HTML5, but I'm going to talk a lot about kind of building UI and using CSS3 and when you can do them together and what makes sense and where it's supported and that sort of thing. Here we go. Let's see how this uh, slide thing works. Oh yeah, go to onslide.com slash pboggs. My slides. My slides? I don't know what they're doing. Okay. Hey! There, there we go. go. Alright, so everyone has your first chance to... Uh... Oh, I don't get a WTF, do I? <laughs> Everyone gets their first chance at WTF and to uh, respond. I'm going to respond also. Well, I can't All right. All right. So I'm trying to get a feel for if there's designers in the room. Uh, I used to call myself a designer, so it's totally cool. I'm a designer. I'm uh, calling myself a designer. Yeah, where is the option for those of us who sit in the middle space? Yeah. Hit them both at the same time. <laughs> uh, I sit in the middle space, too. Uh, I'm kind of like an interface between yeah. developers and designers, so it's cool. Well, slightly different color. But I like this. Like, 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 well, no, you're cool. Yeah. You'll get the vote again. Uh, no, I'm I'm nice. We're not getting options. Like, it doesn't have words. We're definitely not going to let this technology slow us down, so <laughs> right. we're giving it a shot here. Overall. Cool. All right, it looks like we might be developer heavy in here. Yeah, it's fine. All right, I think I just told you this. I started out as a designer. I worked at a small firm first, and I freelanced for, I don't know how many years after I worked at a small firm. But it turns out that the other guys that were designers were much better at design than I was, and I was pretty darn good at coding. So uh, when I say coding, I mean HTML, CSS, and this much JavaScript. So later, if you want to stump me, it's JavaScript. Yay! So, yeah! There we go, there we go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Oh, so. Coming in. <laughs> so I'm trying to get a feel for where we're like, are we mostly people working for larger companies, smaller companies? Uh, smaller company, I think I would kind of describe as like uh, less than, I don't know, 60 employees. So that, I don't know if my smaller company lines up with everybody else's smaller company, but my company I work for has 20,000 employees. Oh, so I'm going to hit the large button. I'm not pretty sure that mine is large. All right, this is cool. I like that there's a lot of smalls in here. Because all of us that work for large companies probably secretly wish we worked for small companies. Because there's a lot of infrastructure that goes along with a large company. Okay, this is going to stop here. So that's what those buttons do. That's what the button Oh, it's cool. So, Mostly small shops, that's what we came up with. So you think you could have made it like a modal that popped up below the text <laughs> instead of making it pop up the wall? That's a good idea. <laughs> they, that's great. why we're beta testing. Yeah, great that's why we're doing yes, here. Absolutely, so it doesn't take over the whole screen. This is truly so, organic. How many for? We've got four development teams. We've got around 50 developers. There's four of us as UI developers, and until recently there was only two of us as UI developers. So there's a ton of check-ins. There's a ton of code. We've got desktop, we've got mobile, we have kiosks that are at our physical auctions. 
So we kind of deal with a little bit of everything. Uh, it's a really interesting kind of mix. And we're actually using a bit of CSS3 in production, but mostly in mobile. So, and we'll get to that. Um, that's about to kind of change. So what do you guys want to talk about first? We can talk about CSS3 and play around with like looking at the syntax and what you can do and the level of support and where it's appropriate, where it's not maybe appropriate. Or we can talk about building a modular scalable UI. Now these things kind of cross each other a little bit. And you'll see, regard, no matter which one we pick first, you'll see some crossover. So, oh, I like the modulars. Oh, look at this. <laughs> I'm voting <laughs> modular also. <laughs> because I, I really, can I vote? <laughs> Don't tell anyone. I can vote more than one. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that. It's a secret of the system. All right, I think. I think we're going with Mosler. All right, so this should go on the side. Oh, yeah. All right, so I'm going to sit in the computer a little bit, and we're going to watch. I was going to bring a laser pointer, but uh, there's a mouse on the computer. <laughs> I don't know why I thought I needed a laser pointer. Like, seriously, this morning, I was on Amazon, like, trying to figure out what laser pointer to go to Best Buy and buy. <laughs> this is presentation. All right, so we're going to go over here. Oh, wait, I got three slides for it. <coughs> you'll have to forgive me. Oh, you'll really have to forgive me. No, don't click on that one. Keep going with the slides. Go back. Oh. Yeah, you're cool. Oh, 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 does everyone know classitis? No. no. I, I, I'm, I'm one of the few people old enough in the room to remember when everyone was like, no classitis. Classitis is when you're writing code and you're putting class after class after class after class in your HTML. And for years we've been told that that's the enemy. The enemy of CSS and standards is classitis. And for many, many years I was right on board. You can probably find tweets of mine where I'm talking about how bad like stacking classes is. Over the last year, I've kind of changed my tune, and I'm ready to declare that class size is good when used wisely. It's kind of, it's with great power comes with great responsibility. Uh, most of you have probably seen good class itis and may not know it. If you've used jQuery UI, that's good class itis. Like, if you do a modal with rounded corners, drop shadows, and a gradient, you're going to get like eight classes on that modal because it's stacking classes. And it works really well. So, like I said, I'm going to back this up. Kind of. I mean, there's some caveats to this kind of thing. Um, there's a few people that are really kind of pushing this idea that class itis is good. I'll get to some specifics of who you can check out. All right. Now, you go to another slide deck. All right. Does your CSS look like this? You're declaring an ID, and then you're declaring whatever's next. And then in the next one, you're kind of redeclaring the ID, right? It's as though we thought that we should show in our CSS files how the DOM is being built, right? Like that's the structure of your HTML. And it's cool. And I'm seeing that everyone's kind of with me, like, yeah, man, that's what mine. Oh, whoa! It's not that Vote again. Can you vote again? No. All right. There you go, you got it. I'm not, I'm not swaying it, I need better. All right, I'm going, all right, you guys are all awesome. So class dismissed. So, we're here. No. so a lot of CSS looks like this. My CSS looks like this. If you've viewed source on anything I've ever worked on, you're going to see this, unless I built it in the last four or five months when I started to realize that it didn't really make a whole lot of sense and that there were some problems there. It's okay, it used to be right. I'm gonna go with it used to be right. Oh, man, there it goes. There's that mouse. So the trouble with IDs, specificity, right? You've seen people do these things where they show you the values and they stack numbers and they build these like strings of characters to show you that your rules are too specific. I think I might have an easier way to look at it. So we've probably all done this. You've got something called news, and then somebody wants one of them to look different. So this is, the, I mean, that's, that's how you do it, right? We'll show you another another example here. Go slide go. Go slide go. 
Yeah. We have a backup system. It's the arrow key over here. <laughs> so same thing. You've got an ID, and you need one of them to be an alert. So you put a class alert, right? If we switch the ID to classes, does anything really change? Now, I know that we're all told that IDs are things that are on the page one time. And that's, I'm totally down with that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't put IDs in your markup. I'm saying that we might want to think about not using them as the hook for your styles. That's all. Because your scripting is still going to need the IDs. And if you have people that write tests like I do at my company, they love the IDs. Man, do they love the IDs. Um, so I'm, this first thing, just change some IDs to classes. Even if it is something that's only one time. And now the rule gets easier. Now, in fact, this is where I'm going to say something really inflammatory. I would recommend, recommend even, not suggest, but recommend using importance and just having a class called alert. Because now, no matter where I put that, that class, it works. It will work everywhere as long as somebody doesn't put an inline alert. Right? There is, like, it's, it's the nuclear option. <laughs> but if you're building something large, the nuclear option is, is exactly what you need, right? Like sometimes you need the nuclear option. Now I would hope, I would hope that I could build stuff where I didn't need to do that. But I'm a realist and I've got 50 developers. And asking them, like I have recently, to stop writing CSS, I don't know if it's going to happen. Like I'm trying. But I actually have, in my care and feeding, I, I take care of a 5200 line CSS file. Now, I did not write those 5,200 lines. I probably wrote a few hundred of them. But I can't stop the whole company because I want clean CSS, right? There's no, like, selling that to somebody who's doing a budget is not going to happen. Like, they giggle, right? They're like, well, does the page render? Yes, then I don't care. I don't care if the CSS is clean. I can talk until I'm blue in the face about performance, but I think the reality is, and this might be inflammatory too, I don't think you get much of a win by cleaning up the CSS, unless you have a 5,200 line it's CSS. It's not fire because if you use techniques like compressing the CSS beforehand, it's totally. not going to make any real effect. Right, yeah. <laughs> so there's cases, right? Like my 5,200 line CSS file, if I can get it down to 1,100, we'll probably see a little bump in performance. But telling somebody who's running a business that I'm going to spend, you know, however many months rewriting the front end code of the application so I can clean up the CSS file so they can save eight milliseconds isn't going to happen. <laughs> Nobody's going to pay for it. No one's writing that check. Absolutely. And that's what developers tell me. They're like, just don't even waste your time. We'll look at our back end processes and we'll fix it somewhere else. Just gzip it in the model. That's right. And we gzip. So there's times, like in my 5200 line CSS file, this will win every time. So at this point, it's kind of my only option. And sometimes it's not a terrible option. So like without important, what you end up doing is your, your color red, your alert, your, your CSS is hosed a little bit, just a tiny bit. Well, now you have to do this, right? And that equals me being sad. Again, hard to argue the case that it's worth a lot of money. But if, if we're starting something, if you're building something new today, if you're working, if you're reworking a section, you can think about these things. Like in my case, I have a 5200 line CSS file, and we still we're adding features, and those new features, we're, we're doing better, right? We're trying to get them better. And one day, we will have a new shiny, awesome UI that I can be proud of. <laughs> I won't tell you that website because it's not actually the real. One. So I know it's weird, right? I'm actually recommending using importance. Yeah. You guys know Jeffy Zeldman and Aaron Meyer, right? They're yeah. standards guys, and I. Like, they were the kings when I started CSS. And I, you know, and guys like Andy Bud, and he said, and everybody recommended doing CSS the way that I showed earlier. Like, it's your, you're stacking these elements, and, and you're just, you're so awesome that you never need important, right? But 50 developers, I, I need important <laughs> I hate that. And they make fun of me too, the developers. Oh, 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 oh. So, this is a real world, this is actually pulled from Maybe like 3,000 of the 5,200. And like, there's so many things wrong with this. And I'm pretty sure that I might have wrote this. <laughs> Somebody before me had made paragraphs bold, right? 
Because you see, I had to undo it. Yeah. <laughs> that was totally appropriate. Right? Yeah. I don't have one around it. I had to make them normal. And then, but, but the design, one of the paragraphs was bold and had this random font size in it, right? So again, like, there is so much wrong with this. And then here, we're like flattening out the margins on this very particular button. Very particular button. It's kind of crazy. Now, there's lots of things that could save you from doing this if you were starting today. But if you just joined a company and they have 5,200 lines of CSS, you can't save yourself from this. I had to normalize the other paragraph and bold that. I could have put a, I could have put a, a strong tag around that other paragraph there. So I should have. I, somebody should hit the WTF right now. Because I should have not put do that bold there. That's right. So That's good stuff. This is another one. I mean, dude, really. A table with a class of listings. And you want the table header that has a class of selected sort column. And in that, there's a div that has a class of sort ascending. And there's an anchor in there. And you want to like do something to it. Like, I, I think you actually want a little arrow pointing down. or like, right? That's probably what the next, that's what uh is. But there's no cascade left. And that's what no planning in four years of neglect gets. It's, it's you no know, cascade. And this is why I make that inflammatory statement that sometimes you have to use the nuclear option. Because the only way to switch the direction of the arrow, if somebody decides that they want to sort differently on the back end and you don't want to rewrite your front end, is you're going to need an important or something, right? It's crazy. So let's pretend. We're going to pretend that we're starting over. We're going to build something new. It's going to be kind of minor, but we're going to build something new. So the first question, and then we're going to go ahead. Do we use a reset? Yes. Does everybody know what a reset is? A browser reset? Like a CSS <laughs> reset? You know, this is like the Yahoo Yui one, there's Eric Myers has one. They're supremely popular and in the days of IE6 were a kind of requirement, right? Like you kind of, if you're supporting IE6 and you don't have a reset, you'll have a 5200 line CSS model. And ask me how I know. Because there's no reset. We have, we, you know, we have margins like insane. So, oh yeah, I like this. I'm surprised how it's. There is a trend right now where people are talking about CSS performance and they're, they're poo-pooing the reset. They're saying you don't need to reset. And I'm not quite there yet. I've been sold on important, and I've been sold on changing classes to IDs, but I haven't been sold on not using a reset. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm glad I'm gonna say yes. I, I say yes as well. And we go for it. Yeah, resets make my life easy. There's pitfalls, but I like them. And I still think, like we're, we're talking CSS performance in the browser. And I think you guys have heard other people talk about the way that browsers parse CSS is crazy. They start like, I thought they go from right to left. So on my crazy rule that ended in the paragraph, it looks for all the paragraphs and then says like, are any of those paragraphs in the crazy table header that had this class? And of those, are any of them in there? So there might be some validity to resets slowing things down, but the fact that they make it so much easier to get designers to feel comfortable with what you're doing and to get product people to understand that what they saw on a, on a Photoshop document is what they're gonna get, the reset really, really, I'm, I'm totally down with the reset. My, my reset's not as nuclear as it used to be, um, but it's still pretty nuclear. Um, I'll show it to you. Let's see. You guys see my code? Is that too small? Yes, that's too small. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Where am I? I try to figure out how to make orange tax. Apple Plus. Yeah. 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 Apple Plus. Is that going to work? It's not brown. It should. Apple Plus. It should work. Yep. Not in yeah. tax yeah. mate. So, you can zoom in clearly, with. You would think that I would have thought of this. Why is my WTF button not working? Doesn't have a WTF button. What's up? Um, so I think I can zoom like. Uh, can you zoom? Uh, zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Zoom. Yeah. zoom. Zoom. There's some. <laughs> 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 Maybe this is good stuff. I'm glad you guys had beers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Use the. Is there zoom in here? Can't you just? Yeah. Like, like, oh, yeah. Oh. What do you think? Yeah. Bigger? Yeah. All right. So Command Plus. Command Plus. Fist plus. Uh, anyone that knows, yeah, shift command plus? Fist plus. Just command plus. 
It's not working. I'm going to use it. So, you guys, if you get to know me, you'll know that I have this thing that I say all the time, which is I was born with a mouse in my hand. And it's absolutely true. I'm old enough to where I should have been working on, on computers like pre Windows, maybe. But no, man. I had like a skateboard and I was in a band. The computer was no use to me until all of a sudden my band had a show and I needed a flyer. And I was like, oh, man. This photocopier thing. <laughs> I need Corel for all. Come on, let's hear from Corel. You can't get caught for Corel for all. So this is my reset. Uh, I'm resetting stuff that I use, a few things that I don't use uh, that somebody else might use, and then the key. I think this is the key right here. So I put like some boxes on the table. You're gonna put things in the boxes. The modules are the things in the boxes, right? No, no, no. The modules are the boxes, my bad. The things in the boxes you've done. I went for an analogy trip. <laughs> uh, the next thing is water. And then section level stuff. Uh, if you have enough differences between like the sections of your website, I don't mean section HTML section tag, I mean section like your About Us page, you know, or an application that lives within your application, I would put that stuff next. And then page level stuff. And then utility classes at the bottom. The page level, the way that I do section, page, utility is all for the cascade, right? So my, my object here is to not have to go nuclear with importance. That's my object. So I'm standing just straight up cascade going for it. So I think I show you this inoculation, this is kind of fun. So this is a this is a reset at the data level. I don't know if you guys can see that. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a reset to everything in a div that has a class of WB. Oh my. Yeah, no, I don't see. I, I looked, man. I looked to see if anyone was like, is anyone out here talking about this? And no one is. So I might have to write about this a little bit. It seems really crazy, but we've got an application that's a widget that lives in multiple applications that are on multiple technology stacks on different servers, and it's served up via JavaScript. So I need it to look the same everywhere. And I really, really need wow. to look the same everywhere. That's so that's your case using this is you have a embeddable and yeah. it wasn't embeddable, this just be like a goal. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a re this is a reset <coughs> there we go. Kind of interesting. Side note. There's the side note. Alright, so now we're gonna go to the next one. So we're gonna start with the content box. And like I said, it's gonna be really basic what we're gonna build, because we only have so much time. And man, I'm burning through it fast. Uh, the code for the box right here is a div, and you've got an inner div, right? And the class uh, is CV, content box. And then I'm just going to fix this real quick. About 180% for the box size. Does that sound good, guys? Ooh, Ooh, too much! <laughs> About uh, 150%. Hey, I bet my fonts are still increased on here. That's pretty good. Uh, yep. Does, that, does everybody know that little trick right there? If you're doing CSS, if you're using scalable fonts, you can change the font size in one place in the body, and it changes it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's bulletproof, man. It's bulletproof. Uh, kind of works, but... With, it works with M's, right? So like, you see I'm using M's and it's going to work with percentages. And we could probably have an entire like awesome fight with sumo suits over pixels and M's, but I don't want to have it right now. Uh, on my stuff that I do, I use either percentages or M's. I don't really do fixed pixels, but at my job, we do fixed pixels because they're a little easier to handle. Um, Look, HTML5. Look at the article, man. So you could drop this class CV and just make an article, and that would probably be the right thing to do. But I already wrote this stuff, so we're just going to roll with it. So the basic CSS for this wrapper is the you know CV. A little margin on the top and bottom. The Z index of 1,001. Dude, just because I got a couple little silly things in the CSS3 part where I needed that, right? And everyone knows position relative. It, it, you don't get your Z index unless you're in position. Right, so you gotta you have to state the position to get your Z index to work. Uh, I, that's kind of old. One of these days I'll check IE8 and see if it still requires it. But I think it's in the spec and I think it's the right thing to do. So my inner box, right? So right here, this one, class inner. It's got a margin on it. 
and then if you're in the content box and you're the inner, you've got some padding. So that seems a little strange, but as you see what we're building, it'll make a little sense. My thought here is that I can use inner anywhere where I want my standard margin for the site. So I've decided that my standard margin is going to be 12 pixels. So anywhere I add a class of inner, I get a 12 pixel margin, which is kind of handy. And then if you're in this content box, which is going to hold all of the content, you have an eight in case I border it or put a background color on it or something like that. All right, and that's So here's our box. And I'm going to open this page. Boxes, right? So here's our box right here. So all the modifiers go into inner class. The div with the class of inner. So this one's got a border on it. Let's go back. Inner, border. So border just gives it a border, right? So I look, I got, I got all the ones that we can do down here. Let's round it. And again, if you if you use jQuery UI, you've seen this. This is, I can't take credit, but I'm going to use it as an you know to show you that this class size thing is kind of it kind of rocks. It's kind of the it's the business. All right, let's shadow it. And you guys see, I'm just going to simplify. That's not much of a shadow, but. I'm subtle sometimes, man. I'm subtle. <laughs> sometimes I've got to be subtle. Sometimes, oh, let's not be subtle. Here we go. How about a radial gradient? Oh, yeah. Mouse in my hand. I know you guys are like, dude, that's five. I don't even know where that five is. I <laughs> wanted to go up <laughs> Let's see. What else we got here? We got rotating. Let's see what that does. This is going to be fun. Rotating. I think you guys are totally getting it. That's sweet, man. That's what this is all about right here. Look, I used to have them all on one page, and that was last, the rotated one. And I'm like, yeah, I think I did that with Flash once. I probably made the browser go like this. Is anybody old enough to have made the browser go like this? A couple people. Come on. With a, with a, like you load the page. That, that wasn't Flash. That was uh, uh, well, so I, I was, it was in the Flash. It was in the Flash script. The Flash was called yeah. Flash. I don't know, Sam. I'm sure that I copied it from like a DHTML website. Mm -hmm. Did you? Know, did anybody know my age? Because you do now. <laughs> you do now. <laughs> All right. Let's see what Smokeout does. I think Smokeout and Radio aren't going to work together. I'm pretty sure of that. <coughs> Smokeout. <coughs> Actually, water. Yeah, that's nice. So, I mean, you see what I'm doing, right? Like, there's classes. I'll show you the classes in CSS. Still yeah. So there's border, right there, rounded with your vendor prefixes. A little background click because there's some craziness that goes on. I got half rounded, didn't try that one. There's a gradient, there's the radial gradient, shadowed, inner shadow, transparent, transparent and gradient, rotating. So you guys can get what's going on here, right? This, this is the jQuery UI model of just stacking classes on a data. And I've got all the stuff, even the filters for IE. So some of the stuff you can really, like you could use now. <coughs> if you need a gradient right now, you can totally make it work everywhere, all the way down to IE6. So some of it's kind of really excellent. Some of it's not, but like a skewed box with a smoke behind it, not too useful. So I'm going to talk about kind of the other way of this. Dramatic balls. Wow, I take a drink. Yeah. So, I got boxes. I'm going to modify the container. And you'll hear people call these boxes. This is location based stuff. So, I got a class called Split 50. I'm going to ask Split 50 here. Let's see what happens. So, now some of our boxes are. 50% boxes. That's all fluid, right? Let's go with the coolest. There's a lot of people that tell you that this kind of thing is bad. Um, I think it's incredibly useful and it has its place. But there is some, you kind of have to be careful because I'll show you the code for it, right? So there's a 30%, two third, one third split. Cool. Um, how about like branding? If you had branding, like my company, we have branding. You know, you can change colors and stuff. 
Remember when I said I wasn't a designer anymore? <laughs> Wait, who gets that? I'm going to give it a classic B, which is another brand. And uh, let's see, I think that's any. Just bear with me. Google Fonts. To the rescue! Oh, 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 look at that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we got to get the WTF button working everywhere. That would be really great. But you see, like, I'm, so at this point, the container, the content box, has become the entire website. Now, pretty dangerous, but pretty awesome too. So you, it's one of the, it's another place. It's like important. Like this is useful. If you have to rebrand your website, this might be the way to do it. But just try to keep it out of the rest of your code, right? Make sure like this is when you would load another CSS file because you don't want this one to have to play with your other stuff where it's going to get complicated. Because the way that these guys work, I'll show you some of the stuff. Really, uh, I think I have this branding on CSS. Right? So now. Over here, I'm actually changing stuff based on the classes, right? So now I'm changing the inner based on the container having that class, changing the CV based on the container having the class. Like, so now we're starting to get into, like, if I needed to change this one right here, this inner, uh, I might need an important to overdo someone else, right? Maybe, <coughs> maybe not. It's two classes. You know, I could do three classes and I'd win. Uh, but maybe important might be appropriate there. So those are the, the, the location based CSS. I think these are perfectly appropriate for making smaller things that go inside of your content boxes and even for adding a class to your content box to trigger that to happen, right? So these would be, like if you had very specific modules, you build your box, you build your grid, and you're ready to put like the search widget in, yeah man, class CB, search, and that stuff can just happen. And I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, switching out everything might not be the best. So the inner box, you don't have to read this text, man. Although bacon is <laughs> hipster, like dude, look at this, look at this. I, I, I like this so much. That's a generator for a random pack. Narwhal pickle jean shorts on me. It's perfect. It's got everything in it. Um, so this is the this is that same code. This is a little content box we just built with the inner, and they're all they have a border on them, and I'm using all these individual classes. Let me show you the individual classes. Let's inspect it. So you can see this guy here, right? Inner border. So look right here on the outer box, the content box. I got a class of half box. And if I remove that box, all hell breaks loose. Go half box, right? So now they're not split anymore. So we're like literally using this little CD with its own classes on the width. And then you can nest them. So it's super duper flexible. And the reason this title says why an inner box? is because that's why we need the inner box. So if you've got two boxes that are 50% width and you want a border on them, it's kind of a problem. It's a real problem in IE, right? But if you put a, something inside of that, the way that a div works is if you don't say anything to the div, you don't tell it how wide it is, it fills up the space that it's in. It's, it's awesome. It's like the best accidental thing. I'm sure it wasn't an accident. It's, it's great. So we use that to our advantage by not declaring a width on the inner div and giving it margin or padding or whatever we need and giving the borders there, right? So they'll just happen. And it fills up that class CV, the content box, perfectly. And it's, again, not my idea. Uh, I think Yahoo's been preaching this double box thing for years for doing layout. It works exceedingly well. If you look at your grid systems, like if you're using like 960 grid or any of those systems, <coughs> that's how they work. Instead of their, like my classes are real simple. Let's take a look at them. Their classes are a little cooler and more complex. Um, so I've got, there's the location stuff, but that's not what we're talking about here. Let me find it. It's short. It's real short. Here it is right here. Check this out. So half box, third box, two third box. And then you, know, you don't have to be crazy math. 50%, 33 and a third, 66.6. .6. You could go on here. And I didn't do it, but you could put three third boxes on a row. And then I added a min height just because my pickled narwhal bomb mini was kind of jacked up. So, you know, this I don't know if we can do this in production. Hopefully we can kind of make everything really work with the right content for the right container. Everyone's cool? Is that making sense? Yeah. Over yet? <laughs> <laughs> Wish there was a WTF button? Yes. Absolutely. So here's something a little bit more. Again, I'm not a designer. Um, and on here, look, HTML5, sweet. I got a little bit. So if you haven't seen placeholder, Works like this. there's no job, zero JavaScript. Yeah, so, got, so just to clarify for everyone who's trying to figure out how the hell to do that without JavaScript, 
What's the attribute? It's placeholder. Yeah, placeholder equals, and you put your text in there. Now, well, that, doesn't work, that. that doesn't work in IE. Uh, I think it works in 10. I'm pretty sure it works in 10. Who cares about IE still? Oh, man, I, I have to care about it. That's, that afterwards, when everyone's totally bored with me, anyone that wants to hear me talk about IE, I'm your guy. Go we'll talk. I got it. Uh, these, uh, the counters are awesome. And you can increment them with the up and down, and you can set the increment. So if you had, if you were doing by tens, you could set tens. Uh, it doesn't work in Firefox yet, but it will. So some of this stuff is like future. If you guys didn't even know you were getting HTML5 today. Watch this one. That's my favorite right here. Watch. Look at that. No JavaScript. That's the browser telling you that you didn't fill in a required field. And how cool is that, man? That's great. That's required. And watch. If I put something gobbledygook in there. It's going to tell me that's not an email address. That's pretty great. And no JavaScript. This is JavaScript. Now, you know, Opera, um, Safari. But that brings up a good point. Safari. Mobile Safari, right? So the silly CSS stuff I was doing to my box is all perfectly legit in the mobile WebKit browsers. Like, it works. So if you're building something for mobile, you can use CSS3 for mobile right now. Oh, that's the other thing. I think we're kind of ready to get to that. Does anyone have any questions about the modular stuff? Did I leave anything out? Did anything make sense? Did it not make sense? Um, the modular stuff when you're applying classes, um, cascading classes that automatically change the box, um, all that makes perfect sense, but with Compass and SAS, you can really achieve the exact same thing with the added flexibility to pass in Arguments to change Absolutely. the fly without, so it's even more flexible. And it is easier to read and really no disadvantages at all. Hey, if you're using, and I haven't even touched Compass yet. I haven't seen. I, in fact, it just started bubbling on my radar. Um, we dabbled in SAS where I worked, but it was before it was ready. It was before they had the SCSS format, and I was looking at that 5200 line CSS file, and they were like, "Hey, we're going to convert this," and I was like, "No." no. Um, SAS is, yeah, so instead of having 15 classes, SAS will just make a new class, right? Like it, it basically just, you're extending the other classes. So if you're doing the modular stuff, SAS is your best friend. It's going to clean stuff up. Uh, if you don't have a plan, and this would be controversial too, if you don't have a plan for your UI, SAS is going to give you the same crappy CSS you had before, right? Like it outputs, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, but not. I like it. I'm down. And somebody here should do, I think someone already did one, but damn it, I missed it. I gotta go on YouTube. Um, I, like the, I like the idea of the preprocessor, uh, and I'm ready for it to, to, to be there. Um, so I'm gonna talk about CSS3 now. And I'll be around afterwards if anyone wants to chat about other stuff. Let's check it out. How do I get to my CSS3 slides? Hold on. Bear with me. Bear with me. Back to this. You guys can WTF me. So, are we using CSS3 right now in production sites? I want to audit the border radius count. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Border radius counts. I'm down with border radius. Shadows, <laughs> radiance, you know, all the, the stuff that we've kind of, I think a lot of us have probably been using a little bit of CSS3 for a while. Is anyone using RGBA? It's my favorite. You'll see. I, 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 would, I, I think everything. There's a, uh, a compass uh, mix-in for RGBA that automatically creates the color on the server and serves it up for IEA. So, like, you just That's awesome. IEA doesn't support so capacity. Wait, 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 It'll automatically generate. Are you volunteering to talk about compass? Two weeks, <laughs> even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Preach to me, man. After after we're done here, tell, tell me about Compass because literally I came across it today. I, somebody sent me like on, on the Twitters there was this like SAS versus uh, less comparison, and like in the comments it was like a million people talking about how awesome Compass was, and I was like, that's new. Compass new to me, so that's good. I like that most of us appear <laughs> to be using CSS3 on production sites. That is except for two people. We're the whole It's okay. <laughs> I think a lot of people are stuck for some reason. And, and it may not be under their, in their control, right? Yeah, it depends on what you want. I see it, yeah. yeah we're all, let's see if my slide thing works again. We're all, look, I even said it, I have to support IE6. So I kind of don't, but I kind of do. At my company, we have a level of support that is functionality only. 
So if something doesn't work in IE6, we fix it. You know, we've, we supported it for so many years that it's kind of like it doesn't come up that often anymore. Uh, but I support it, so, you know, we work around it. Like, I, I, I'm cool with IE6. IE6 prepared us all for the mobile browser war that is certainly coming. <laughs> it, it's not quite here yet, Amen. but it's coming. And everything that you learned in the browser wars will be yeah. totally appropriate when the mobile browser wars hit. But we'll have tools like SAS. Like, I, I think that maybe you could serve different CSS to different browsers. JavaScript to the rescue. JavaScript to the rescue. Oh, slides. Leslie, it's, it's failing, man. Well, well, you've got your fallback. So. All right, sorry, I error. So mobile, it's uh, more banking than you think, CSS3. It really is. Somebody hit the WTF. But it's really like, I, I'm, I'm constantly surprised every time I take a look, like, hey, what can I use now? I'm constantly surprised that we're actually really moving forward. A lot of the things, if you, the way that you apply your CSS3 stuff, if you're careful with it, you can probably do it right now, right this minute. You can be doing things like, I don't know if you noticed on that form that I was hitting, there was there was a the glow that was happening. It's just a, it's just a shadow on the on focus, right? Well, if IE8 doesn't do that, who cares? Like, really, you know, I mean, the, like, it does, the experience doesn't have to be the same in every browser. You want, like, if, if you're cool enough to have Safari and be using my website, I'm cool enough to give you something for it, right? Like a little token reward. But everything probably needs to function, and your, your experience of whatever you sell, whatever you do, needs to be intact. So. And mobile browsers are your best friends until they aren't. So I got really excited about the scalable vector graphics. Until I learned that Android 2.3 doesn't, no go. 2.3 is like, Android didn't support them until 3.0. Right. So, and 2.3 is still like where I work, where we have a pretty high volume of Android traffic. It's like 60%, man. So, you know, they're your best friends until they're not. So, uh, and if you, you use, ignore, I'm sorry, have you used CSS Pi before? Because that solves a lot of IE7, 8, totally. 6 problems. Yeah. Are people familiar with that? Absolutely. It's a little, little. Modernize it also, yeah. right? What were you saying? CSS, CSS Pi. Pi, it actually gives you rounded corners, drop shadows, and IE6, yeah. 7, and 8. It's a little, yeah. a little awkward, but yeah. once you get, once you figure out what you can do when you can't do, it will let you really I, use On my personal free. stuff, I use, I've been using, I used to use, uh, this again, I used to use IE7.js, and then I used IE8.js, and then I used IE9.js, and then I started using Modernizer. Those but are any way you cut it, it's a polyfill, right? That's the term that we're all calling it now. Polyfill. Did we decide polyfill? Yeah, I think we did. Uh, <laughs> like a polyfill is some kind of JavaScript. And, and it's, again, like a, just another reason that you could be doing a lot of this stuff right now. So maybe you don't even need, you don't have to ignore IE. You just gotta figure out how you wanna deal with IE. Uh, where I work, we deal with IE by like, you know, hey man, it doesn't get rounded corners and drop shadows. It swears, <laughs> right? And everyone's cool with that. So I'm gonna, Cover some of the best supported features in that. And you stop if you have a question. But first, I'm going to issue a challenge. <coughs> oh. oh, yeah, for the challenge. Uh, can I use.com? This is epic. Just type in what you want, it'll tell you where it works, and it seems to be really, really up to date. <laughs> so I just said this, man. Excuse me while I fix my thing. I must have closed my tab. Because I do that sometimes. Yeah. This is the awkward pause. It is totally the awkward pause. I don't see my slide, but I'm going I'm to issue the command. But, but if somebody could send me a really great example, a border image, I'll pay value 10 bucks. I say PayPal because I keep, I forget to bring cash everywhere I go. <laughs> but seriously, I, I scoured, I was gonna, I was ha always been excited about border image, but I can't find anything really great. And the, the caveat here is that it can't be a Polaroid picture background, and it can't be something to make it look like an iOS button on a, on a mobile device, because that's pretty cool if you do that. Uh, and it can't be like a glass button. So seriously, send me an email. I got 10 bucks paid off. And it'll be a gift, so you get the full time off. <laughs> so, background size uh, is awesome. Let me show you the, uh, my, my excellent, excellent example first. I've got a couple of these. 
Pi does it for multiple backgrounds. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Dude, really? Yeah. Man, that's good stuff right there. So let me open up one of those files. But um, what are you, and this looks really good, but what about when you're trying to be responsive and you've got, I guess, a pretty big image file to start with? Yeah. If you're trying to do mobile stuff, there's a whole big, I know there's a big brouhaha right now about, you know, the W3C wants to do one type of tag, crazy thing, and everybody just wants a picture, and blah, blah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I'm waiting for the brouhaha to come up with a really good solution. Mm -hmm. um, on the mobile stuff that I work on, it's enterprise stuff, mm -hmm. and it's uh, people buying cars, so we don't really have many background images on there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's extremely focused on performance, so I don't have the solid answer on what the solution is, uh, but there's JavaScript solutions out there for, you know, in server-side solutions. To, basically sniff your resolution or your user agent and serve up a different set of images. Uh, yeah, that's a good call. Yeah. That makes it less awesome. Uh, <laughs> so the background size, real quick, you've got cover, you've got contain. Uh, cover, cover is the like, largest thing that your image will cover, and contain keeps it in its container. And if I go back to my slides, I think, On background size, you can do length, width, and height. You can set just one of the others automatically. It kind of works like you would expect it to work. So it's, you know. And there's the Delray contain. You've seen the example. Uh, on the multiple, uh, on this little crazy guy with the, uh, I'm using some media queries, which is a nice slide. Um, you guys know media queries, right? Yeah. I'll probably show you. I'll show you my first media query thing I did. This is. Band website, and it's just it's adaptive, right? It's not responsive. We just had two sizes, and it's just a media query doing it. It's pretty cool. Media queries are fun. Um, I'm getting closer to my time here, so you guys tell me if you want me to dig into one of these. RGBA. So everything on here is using RGBA, right? So there's transparencies coming through. Let's get what into that. What if you love multi-level hex? If you love hacks, what if you love using hex? You can use hacks. There's just no alpha transparency in hacks. There's alpha transparency in hacks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can get alpha transparency all the way back to IE6 with a filter. So that the filters in there. Uh, if you let me show you the alpha stuff in here. Like, so right, here's a filter for gradients. There is an alpha filter in here somewhere. Who is right above that? That's gradient. Wow, man. So, so I, what I'm doing here, I guess, I'm going to walk away from my computer for a minute and fall in part. There's an image, there's another background image, and all these boxes are just, if you've done RGBA, they're 255, 255, 255, and then a level of transparency, right? So it's almost like taking Photoshop and stacking divs, not divs, but layers, and then just deepening and lessening the gradients. And like if I change the background color on that, the whole background color changes, right? So because everything is transparent. Uh, super cool. I don't think a lot of designers know that these are out there. I don't see a lot happening with them. And the reason I'm showing you this ghost party thing again is if you watch as this giant image loads, that background color will change. Mm -hmm. And everything changes. It's all just transparent. Mm -hmm. 
this levels of transparency. Man, it looks so much better on my screen than it does up there. <laughs> you see, like, the, the photo's transparent. But it's a transparent PNG. And, and the, every div on there has a level of transparency. Uh, and in the object-oriented world, you could, if you want the level of transparency to be the same, it's classic transparency, right? And you can just apply it. And when you stack to 50%, you get 100%. So it's really, like, it really is like working with layers in Photoshop. And I think the more designers get that this is available and can actually can be without a polyfill really, you can you can filter it back to IE6. Like I'm very surprised that we don't see more of this on, on the web. I think people just don't know that it's that it's there, that it's available. So I'm telling you guys, get your designers, if your designer get on some hard GPA stuff. Uh, scalable vector graphics. Fuck Christmas still is. That thing's like, and that makes sense for, for the retina display. Is anytime we're using an icon or anything like that, we'll go scalable vector graphic. Well, As we can use fonts for, for you know, for, to do the same thing with the icons, but I kind of like the idea of it working the same way, right? Like you work with an SVG the same way you work with an image, which is pretty awesome. As soon as Android does better support. Well, the support is, I think it's 1.1 one, one or 3.0, and it could probably be full spec by Maybe full second four of them, I just yeah. don't know. They'll get there. I think I think Google knows that it's important. Um, here's a couple of utility things. The next couple of things are utility. Word wrap, if you guys are, have had this trouble, I have this problem all the time. You have a data table. And someone will put in these crazy URLs and in a data table it just blows it out. It just blows the data table out. So this is if you've heard anyone talk about the W3C and the working group and everybody doing paid the cow paths, this is paid the cow paths. So I uh, Internet Explorer has always had this word wrap thing you could use, and it'll break stuff. And now it works pretty much everywhere. It's IE6, IE7, IE8, IE9, IE10, and all the modern browsers. The catch is you got to have a width. So if you don't have a width, it won't trigger it. So, like in the case of my data tables, they're all there's no widths defined. So that that UI dev it doesn't really help me unless I wanted to find widths. Uh, we have these tables that are built dynamically, so it's really difficult to define a width on a data set. But that's a super great thing to have in case you need to wrap a word like this. Right? And if I inspect that guy, let's see. Word wrap, break word. So it's a real simple syntax. And so it beats overflow head as well. But that's all doable, right? That's a fix for a problem. Um, so for CSS3, we talk like animation. This is the delight thing, right? This is, I wouldn't think that you would want to make these work for IE7 and 8. Like I think it's stuff that you would do for people that have the better browsers and everyone's seen this kind of thing, right? You know? Is that being driven by the white kids CSS3 network? No, I'm using the, not, not, I'm not doing the, these are simple transitions. So, and the reason that I'm showing transforms and transitions is because they're well supported. So the CSS3 right? Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, CSS3. So I don't have any JavaScript on anything in here right now because frankly you don't want me to write JavaScript. Uh, I'm working on that. Uh, and, and so there is this other, there's a weird thing with the animation spec where uh, Safari has their own and I'm not really covering that today. I didn't really want to go into it. And I'll show you this code. The code for the transition is really, really simple as long as I can find my class transition in here. Hey man, no one called me out for being a single line kind of guy. I'm pretty surprised about that. Turn on the work line. Yeah. Type in the word. There you go. It's it's maddening. Put the mouse down. <laughs> it's maddening, isn't it? So here's the transition right here. That's the that's the one on the form field. But you see they're pretty simple. So there's a, a couple different ways to ease in. It seems to be the one that works the best across all the browsers right now is ease in and out. Uh, there's like a, there's Cubic and a couple other crazy ones in here. Uh, I got a whole thing on. Edit that. Hey man, we got a WTF button in here, so uh, it really matters. Beers, anyone? Anyone? Beers? <laughs> Stands for why the face, right? Why the face. No, you saw it. Uh, here we go. Oh, I knew I had it. All right, so the easy way. So simple. So 
So here's the timing stuff. I tried linear, ease in, ease out, ease in and out. It's really hard in Firefox to see any difference between any of them. And I couldn't get the, the cubic to work in Firefox. So, yeah. What is that face? So here's some simple, you know, right? And I'm just applying the class of transition on an element. Again, no JavaScript, it's all just straight, right? it's gonna work. Mm. All your mobile browsers are gonna handle these transitions. Uh, really? All the modern browsers are handle, tra handle transitions. So they're pretty great. And there's, you know, kind of a useful, maybe, use of it. When my browser's not choking, too many transitions. Uh, there's a lot of people that say the transitions cause trouble with performance. I would think that they might be right. Um, I don't know if you would ever really do something like this, but this is a really slow transition with a background image on a div, and it's making like a panorama. You know, could be useful. I'm not sure. Ten seconds might be a little too slow. So photo deck, and this is just some simple CSS here. On the hover of the div that's containing the images, you're gonna see move them and scale them and rotate them. And again, scale and rotate, just a class. Scale, rotate, right? So we're, we're doing the object-oriented stuff on the photos and the CSS3 stuff. So I rushed us through the last the tail end there because I, I think we might be running a little late and uh, I spent way too much time talking about modular stuff, but I think you guys we're probably more interested in the modular stuff. Uh, the CSS3, I think the takeaway for all the CSS3 is find out where you can use it. Find out where it makes sense for where you work and the projects that you're working on and start putting it in. And I, I think I have it down here as my one more thought, but how old is the code at your job, right? So I work at a really large company and there is code that I kid you not is 10 years old. It's 10 years old, right? So what you're build, what I mean by this, you're building today by the time you retire that, I don't even know where we would be if it's 10 years from now, right? I think mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So code that's going to live for a year or two years, I think CSS3 is appropriate and maybe it should be almost required, right? Like you should be thinking about CSS3 for your code that might live for two years. You should be thinking about HTML5 for your code that might live for two or three years. And you can put in a polyfill and take it out when it's well accepted, right? Just like you can pull your, most people now have pulled filters and IE6 hacks out of their CSS. But we didn't hold up our design and we didn't hold up our products while we waited for everybody to get off of IE6. We worked around IE6 and we moved forward and we moved the web forward and everybody moved everything forward. So I think this is a thought that maybe not everyone thinks about. Because I said it to my boss's boss and he giggled when I said that we, I'm like, a code we're writing today is gonna be alive for four years and he goes, I hope not. I hope not. Now, he's my boss's boss, so I didn't. Be, I, I should have taken him and been like, let's look at some code, man. Like, come in here and let's look at some code. Because I got stuff that had files that haven't been touched since 2000, 2001, 2002. So the code you're writing today is going to live for a while. And if you've ever seen the Wayback Machine, it might live for a long time. Really long time. Like, thank God my first website is not on the Wayback Machine. <laughs> So the modular stuff, my, my conclusion is that specificity is the enemy of complexity. That might be an oversimplification, and it might not necessarily be true, but it's something when you're building something that's going to be complex, think about it as a system of interface components, right? Like we're talking front-end code. It's a system of interface components. You're not building pages. You're not building features. You're build, you want to build a system that's going to work, and it's going to work now, and it's going to work in eight years, right? Because it may be there for eight years. You want to think about abstracting these pieces. So if you're if you're constantly floating things left, it's times again, kind of weird. But SAS takes care of the weirdness, right? So now I SAS might be the win here. Like I forgot to put that here. Holy crap, SAS is kind of the win here. Uh, Location-based styles should be used sparingly. Uh, I still am a big fan. We do vehicle data, and there's a div, and it has a class of WB, which actually stands for workbook. Uh, that was me not thinking ahead when I was building the workbook <laughs> and was planning on reusing the code over and over. But you know, WB works because it's nice and short. But that class triggers the widths of all the divs in there. And it sets you know, labels to be displayed blocks so they're above the data that they're labeling, right? 
And I think that that's perfectly okay, right? Because me writing, making that one box require 50 classes would be absurd. So I've got this box now that a developer can just grab the 